All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, we are excited to be able to uh, have the last session and our closure of the day be one of the coolest uh, sections of GCC. Um, it's very visual, and the things that she'll be able to tell you about is going to be fascinating and interesting, and she's got great data to be able to share with you and locations that you can be able to find this data. Um, this is our director, Michelle Beck, of the Criminal Justice Analysis Center. And uh, Michelle, we're, we very much appreciate you uh, presenting this afternoon and being our closer and heavy hitter. Oh, my, no pressure. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> um, well, I am Michelle Beck, and uh, I will go ahead and proceed with um, talking a little bit about data, one of my favorite things, um, maybe not everyone's, but um, it is uh, tough to be the, the last person, but um, stick with me and um, I'll, I'll keep it pretty quick. So, first, I just want to give you a little intro into what the criminal justice justice analysis center is. We are 1 of 53 statistical analysis centers that are across the country. Every state, except for Texas has 1, and then some of the. Um, areas other areas do we were reestablished in 2018 to create a data warehouse for a central place for people to find information about criminal justice data. In North Carolina, we um, produce data informed publications. I'll show you a couple of those in just a second. And we support the needs for not just the governor's crime commission, but other um, people that have questions. So, if you have questions about data, let us know. We can maybe help you out. And we also carry out um, some data collection. The requirement for burn jag to collect death and custody data. So the Death and Custody Reporting Act of 2013 requires that the SAAs collect data and report to the um, feds quarterly. Um, these are some examples of the publications that we, we've created over the last few years. Uh, they run the gamut from um, different types of things. We have two main data sources that we use. One is the traffic stop data. And that's reports from all of the law enforcement agencies in the state on traffic stops. And as you see, the one there in the middle with the car, with the cool pie charts um, for wheels. Uh, we try to make uh, our portal snapshots very graphic, um, interesting, but informative. So those are one pagers that we create on a variety of topics. As you see, there's traffic stop. Uh, the one on the top right is a, a portal snapshot, so a one pager that looks at the different um, influences that happened during the stay at home orders with COVID 19 on crime in our state. And that uses the NIBRS data, National Incident Based Reporting System data. And then there's another portal snapshot you can see over towards the left. That's on firearm related um, offenses in North Carolina. So then we also create um, publications that are called justice analysis reviews. Those are three to seven pages about on one topic. This one that I'm showing here as an example is identifying domestic violence in North Carolina. But there we have them on several topics. And then we also have some annual reports that we create. I mentioned that we were required to collect data on death and custody. <clears throat> and we have an annual report that we have uh, the 22 and 23 reports posted online. And we also, for the first time, are creating reports on the NIBRS data. And that's the data that the law enforcement agencies in North Carolina report to the um, State Bureau of Investigation that is then reported up to the, the FBI. And you'll see that on the left. Uh, one of our staff created the, the cover here that is a, a graphic representation of North Carolina, um, which I am pretty proud of. So, <laughs> uh, but we have those are broken down into three different reports based on the crime categories. 
One is crimes against persons. Another is crimes against property. The, both of those for 2022 are on our website and the crimes against society will be shortly. So we are the data folks. Um, sometimes called data geeks. I, I, I represent that. I'll, I'll take that. I think that represents uh, who I am and what we do. But there's been a lot of talk in the last little bit about reporting data <clears throat> and um, and Tony even mentioned to define the data that you're um, reporting on and that type of thing. So I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of um, info on what we mean by data quality and there are different dimensions on that. So this is not going to be long, I promise. <laughs> First, I'm going to start with the sort of pink um, circle down on the left hand side. Accuracy, I think everybody's familiar with what accuracy um, does to data. We have a bit of a not, not a terribly complex sort of saying. Um, you've probably heard data people say junk in, junk out. If you put junk into the system, we can't get we can't make much of out of it. So the the results of any analysis we do are not going to be very good. So accuracy, one of the examples that I'll use here going through these data dimensions um, is a uh, an easy to understand one. <laughs> if if you have a phone number in the system, if you don't have all of the digits correct, you're not going to be able to get in touch with the person you want to reach. So that's accuracy. Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, and then consistency it flows from accuracy. Consistency is really the fact that if you, there's something that you're measuring, you should be able to capture that and leverage it against other values, other places. You should be able to find the same. So using the phone number example, um, if in one database it's listed with the area code and the seven digit number, but in another place it um, adds the international code in front of it. So even though it's the same value that you're getting at, so the phone number could be correct, it's not consistent in the way that it's captured. So you would not you would not find them to be um, accurate in both systems without that identifying piece of um, information of how it is um, entered into the system and that they have to be consistent. Completeness is um, just the fact that everything that you need for the um, value is in there. So um, I'll tell my age, I guess, a little bit, but um, I remember when you had to start using the area code to make local calls and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get used to this. And then now people, I said something to that about that the other day and somebody said, oh, really? You didn't have to do that? So, um, but anyway, so completeness now with a, a phone number, it's it's not just the seven digit number. We have to have the area code. And then uniqueness, um, that is making sure that there are not duplicate values in, in your databases or the data that you're reporting about so that each record is only in there once. Timeliness is a big thing, uh, of course. It, it helps to have timely, real, real time, as close as you can data, but we know that that isn't always the case, but as streamlined um, and operate as possible to have the, um, to reduce errors, um, to, um, sorry, <laughs> um, to, to have the, um, information so that you can make decisions on um, and that type of thing. And also something that Adon Adonica mentioned, timeliness doesn't only mean that you're, you know, reporting data that uh, about events that happened just last week or whatever, but the, the time frames that are defined by the program reporting periods are very important, um, whether it's calendar year, federal fiscal, state fiscal, by quarters, that type of thing. It's, it's an important part of data that if it's not um, 
accounted for, if, you know, if you don't report in the right time period, you're affecting the accuracy and everything else. And then the last one there is um, validity. So this is that validity of measures is the degree of which the, the data elements measure what they mean to be measuring. So um, if um, we have certain programs that we want to categorize, making sure that everyone understands the definitions of those and everyone's using those definitions the same in the same way. Um, part of why I, I mention this is because there have been several studies, well, um, before even mentioning that, in the last five years, the notion of data-driven decision-making or evidence-based decision-making has become sort of the, the standard as opposed to in previous years uh, when I first started in my career, there were there, you didn't hear that about much. But at the same time, there are some studies that show that um, an estimate of about 45% of data records have at least one critical um, error that can Im impact their ability to be used effectively. And also, uh, there was a study out not long ago from Forbes that was publishing some survey information from CEOs of companies and 84% expressed concern about the integrity or quality of their data. Um, it, because they use it now so much for making decisions and hope, and that's what we're, we're moving toward, um, in all different realms, not just, not just business, definitely in government. And so we want to make sure that the data that we have to make those decisions with are as complete as possible. So that's my little primer on data, but I, I also wanted to give you a, a couple of sources for um, data. One is our justice data portal. Uh, that is, we created this in March of 22. And uh, I, it's not coming on. I have to move this over from my other screen. Um, and it is a place that you can get data. Um, let me make sure. Is that showing up on the um, for you all? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so this is our data warehouse that we have. Um, I mentioned the two pieces of data that we use for our publications at this, this time are traffic stop data and the national incident based reporting system. This is the sort of landing page. It tells you a little bit who about who we are, what this is, and it gives you some quick facts. These do change. Um, so if you, when you come to the, the site, you can get just little um, blurbs. Each time you come here, it'll be a little bit different. But all of the information that these uh, quick facts that are on the state here um, is available in this in the interactive <laughs> dashboards here. So these are the crime <laughs> dashboards. I'll just give you a, a couple of examples of what's what's behind here. It does take a few seconds for each page to load. So the first page with criminal offenses, it shows the state and a heat map of the crimes per 100,000 people in each of the counties. I mentioned that the reports that we have produced for the NIBRS data are in three different sections, the crimes against persons, crimes against property and crimes against society. Those are the offense groups that we that are commonly used to separate the different types of criminal offenses. And one of the things I want to point out about the data portal, it is not required for law enforcement agencies to report their NIBRS data to the state. So this box here in the top right hand corner is a pretty important element for you to understand and to be aware of. So each of the counties and Alamance um, gets to be first since they are first in the alphabet. Um, 
statewide, 97% of the population of the state is covered by agencies that report data for their jurisdictions. For Alamance County, that's a, that ends up being 100% because in Alamance County, all of the law enforcement agencies report. And that's important to know, to, to note, because in a moment, I'm gonna show you a, a county or two that that's not the case. So this page here gives us an op gives you an opportunity to see how similar or different a county. So this one is Alamance is to the state. This pie chart, the inside chart, the inside circle shows you the breakdown by offense group by statewide, and the outer one is the county. So you can see that in Alamance County, twenty five percent of the reported offenses in 2022 were crimes against person, and that was 21% for the state as a whole. To look at another county as an example, um, let's look at Chowan County, and I just kind of chose these to because there are some differences. One thing you noticed, it hopefully, is that this chain, this um, chart here changed in Alamance County. The top offense was simple assault, 15%, followed by narc narcotics or drug violations, um, about 11%. For Ch Chowan County, it's much more property crime. And that's reflected in the pie chart here. So it, once again, in the inside circle, uh, property crime was 59.4%, but for Chowan County, property crime represented 72% of the crimes in 2022 for them. And that's reflected in the top 10, larceny, destruction damage, breaking and entering, and then drug or nar narcotic violations. So, and as you see, Chowan still has 100% of uh, the county agencies reporting. I'm going to pick another one. Um, let's see. Not to pick on anyone, but just to show as an example uh, what the differences are. Mitchell County, only 15% of their agencies in that county are reporting the NIBRS data for 2022. So the reason that is important, you want to use any of the numbers here with caution because they're not well represented. So there's, you know, 85% of the population in that county is in a jurisdiction that their agency did not report NIBRS data. Okay. I just want to show one more thing and then, um, so this is another page. This is our crime type page. This one starts out at statewide. And then you can select different counties and see where there are differences. I'm going to this time select a different county. I'm going to select Guilford. So once again, Guilford has 100% of agencies reporting. And this shows for uh, person crimes, you can look at different um, specific offenses there. And it shows the location of the offenses and the changes over the Four year period that we've had NIBRS data. One other thing I want to point out is there are um, reports here on uh, the offender characteristics, victim demographics, or which should be named characteristics as well, and also the victim offender relationship. And so this can give you information when we look at the victim. 
um, numbers on, let's see, uh, was in Guilford. So it's by county. You can look to see how if you just saw that the race breakdown for victims changed a bit for for Guilford County. Um, another county that you'll see a, a significant difference is here in Duplin County. The Hispanic victim population is fourteen percent. Um, that's quite a bit higher than the state as a whole, which is 8.6%. Um, and then there are age breakdowns by gender and then race and gender age breakdowns further down. Okay. So that shows you a little bit of the justice data portal. If you're Curious if you want to, like your county, find out, well, who is it that isn't reporting in my county? You can look here and it'll show um, who does or who does not report and the population that their jurisdiction covers in that county. There are two other data sources I wanted to just quickly mention to you and show you that are available. One are the NC FASTER reports. This has a story map here at the, the bottom that um, has firearm injury information that breaks down um, data by the different firearm characteristics. And you can also filter this by county um, to get information. Um, and then, oops. Let's see. There's also um we're here. It's the same thing. There are also reports on the, the NC Faster, the quarterly updates. These are two pagers and they, they show specific counties that um, information for percent increases for injur injuries reporting to emergency departments by quarter and firearm related. So these may be pieces of information that may help you in, in different ways and for you to be aware of. Okay, that's all I have. That's the um, website for the Justice Data Portal, justicedataportal.nc.gov. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. If there were any, Jason. So there was kind of one. <laughs> Courtney <laughs> Dunkerton indicated in here, she said NC Fast question. I, I don't know if that's a is this related to NC Fast, or if, um, and maybe Courtney, if you could add a little bit to that? Ah, she said she just couldn't hear what you had said about, I uh, suppose, the. Yeah, it, it's NC Faster is the web website that has the report. You have it's a part comment. Of NC Detect. You have a comment, Michelle from Angela Scott. This is thank you for this part of the workshop. I'm a crime analyst, as well as a grants manager for my department. Oh, good. I don't see any That's questions. Serious. Does anybody have any questions? If so, please add them to the chat. Doesn't look like anybody has any questions, Michelle. You may be off the hook. <laughs> well, if any come to mind later, please feel free to get in touch with me. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I just wanted to provide a couple of uh, quick reminders. Uh, one being that the PowerPoint and the guidelines have been posted to the GCC website. 
Um, we're going to be adding recordings next week. And we are also doing a Q&A uh, for our chat questions. We'll be going through and scrubbing the chat, making sure that we answer each of the questions that you have uh, asked today, um, which we may have missed. And then we'll provide an email to everybody that attended um, so that you'll know when we post that Q&A so that you don't have to continuously look at our website to try to find it. Um, wanted to remind everybody of October 30th, which will be our grant writing workshop. Um, we're going to be sending invitations the first week of October, and so it'll be similar to this. You'll have to register as an attendee to be able to attend. Um, we've got uh, a registration link that we've created, so we're going to be sending that out along with a nice invitation to try to get everybody excited about it. Um, we also have the intention of posting our RFAs um, by the writing workshop as well. That way it'll give us a chance to be able to really dig in and talk a little bit about uh, grant writing and those and what's expected as well. Um, you heard a lot from our grant administrators today. Um, you heard a lot from our planners as well. Um, we have a wonderful staff um, that we're very proud of here. And uh, we very much want to thank all of the presenters today that uh, took part in the presentations. Uh, I did want to invite Caroline Farmer in case she has any closing remarks she would like to impart us with. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody joining us and we look forward to a great year together um, doing the good work that you all have proposed. So thank you so much for being here.